I want to pick one. I want to take Matthew 5.38 as an example. Let's take eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Old Testament retribution starts back in the book of Genesis. Cain, Genesis 4.15, Cain is avenged sevenfold. Remember that? God says to Cain, anybody touches Cain, I put seven curses on him over Cain. Seven times I avenge Cain. One man for seven men. Seven men for one man. The law pared that down. Exodus 21, 24, eye for an eye. God comes along and goes, okay, seven times is too much. If a guy kills a member of your family, you don't get to go kill seven of his brothers. It's ridiculous. Here's what you can do, though. If he kills a member of your family, you get to kill a member of his family. If he stabs your eyeball, you get to stab his eyeball. If he cuts your hand off, you get to cut his hand off. If he steals your cow, you get to steal his cow. Fair. Fair game. Right? That's the law. You've heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I say to you, Jesus said, if a man attacks you, give him your other cheek. If he asks you to carry a load of mile, carry it too. In other words, Jesus doesn't allow the, the paring down to stop the way the law allows it to stop. Jesus seeks restoration for his enemies rather than retribution for his enemies. So Jesus is trying to bring a full expression to the law. What was the law doing in this situation? It was actually trying to make the world a little better place. Because before, if Cain kills a guy, you get to kill seven of Cain's family members. That lasts all the way to the law when God goes, okay, we've got to do better than that. One for one, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Jesus comes along and goes, we can do even better. What if... You didn't get an eye for an eye. What if, if a guy took your eye, you let him have two eyes? Now, the reason why I think in grace circles, we've taken Jesus' Matthew 5 teachings and we said, what Jesus is doing is elevating the law to make it more difficult is because love is far more difficult than obedience. Loving people as they are is far more difficult than obeying the letter of the law. Because people are real and they move in through the world in a real way. And that's different than obeying the rules and the regulations. And so this is, this is a reality that I want you to think about. I want you to just dwell on this for a moment. You are expected to discern the spirit of a passage. Why? Well, because you have the Holy Spirit. You are expected to discern the spirit of a passage. Don't defend a text. Defend people. I think that last thing is what got Jesus at odds with the Pharisees. Jesus did not defend the law and the prophets. Jesus defended people. And the Pharisees defended the law and the prophets. The Pharisees said, the Bible says it, it's the way it ought to be. Now they didn't say Bible. Let's say Torah. Torah says it, it's the way it ought to be. I don't care if you like it or not. No, no, your opinion doesn't matter. Oh, it hurts you? Too bad. Torah says it. Jesus comes along and goes, wait a minute. Woman, where are your accusers? Okay, he without sin among you, casts the first stone. Letter of the law, she dies. She's committed adultery, John 8. There's no room for her feelings. There's no room for Jesus' feelings. There's no room for compassion. She's supposed to die. And you could say, yeah, but we're under the new covenant. No, we're not. He hasn't died on the cross and risen from the dead and poured out the Holy Spirit. We're living in an old covenant world. And she committed adultery in Israel, which means she's supposed to be stoned to death. And Jesus' response is, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, stone her to death. But I say to you, if you've not sinned, you get to be the person that kills all adulterers and adulteresses. You get to be the judge for everybody else's sin, if you haven't failed, and if you qualify, by all means, kill her. And everybody drops their rocks. And Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, there's nobody here to accuse me. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Now, if you read the Bible like a Pharisee, she's supposed to die. But if you read the Bible like Jesus, God loves her. Now, the difficult part of this is how do you... How do we defend people at the expense of defending a text? Well, let's think about one of those moments. Look, look at Luke 9. I've quoted this a lot, but I want you to see it. Jesus' disciples just asked him if they could call down fire on a Samaritan village because the Samaritan village didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Hey, you want us to go ahead and kill him like Elijah did? 
And he turned and rebuked them, Luke 9, 55, 56, and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you're of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, here, this is a, I know I quote this a lot, but we never really slow down and think about this much. They are quoting the, the prophets. They are in the scripture. They have scriptural right. If you disagree with God, maybe you're supposed to die. So, hey, these people disagree with you. You want us to call down fire and kill them? And Jesus says, you don't know what spirit it is that's driving you to want to kill people with fire, do you? I rebuke that. I didn't come to kill people. I come to save people. Now, what we could say is, Elijah's under the old covenant. Therefore, under the old covenant, people die by fire coming down out of heaven. Jesus is still teaching under the old covenant, guys. He's not teaching in the new covenant. He's still teaching under the old covenant. And what I believe he's saying is it was never, listen carefully, it was never my dad's will. This is how I see this. It was never my dad's will for Elijah to call down fire on people and kill them. That was not my father's heart. In fact, it's the wrong spirit for you to call that my dad. Guys, the Jesus way was so confusing that in John 14, when he's about to go to the cross, his disciples say to him, just show us what the Father looks like. And Jesus says, how long do I need to be with you before you realize if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Now, we, we cut them guys down a lot. We go, gosh, why are they so stupid? Why can't they see? Because their image of the Father calls down fire on people and kills them. Their image of the Father is, if you don't like me, you get ready, because I'll get you. And here's Jesus coming along, letting adulterous women go free and visiting Zacchaeus' house who steals from his own people and won't call down fire on a bunch of rebellious Samaritans and even rebukes them and says they don't know what spirit they are of. Because you and I, okay, I'll just say me. If I'm there, I'm with the disciples. I'm going, hey, I know the Old Testament. Let's call down fire. We'll show them, man. I bet this will be the last time they reject you. Call down fire and burn the whole village. You come through next time, I bet they'll be setting up a tent and have a camp meeting because who wants to get burned up whenever the, all they got to do is be obedient and they can have life? And Jesus would have to rebuke me too and go, Paul, you don't know what spirit you're of. That was never my heart to do that. You need to learn to be discerning as to the difference in the spirit. You know why the apostle Paul comes along late in the New Testament and says, Try the spirits and see who they be of because there's a lot of spirits going out into the world. You know why he had to say that? Because that was the task of the early church that, that Israel never had. Israel never, ever, ever was challenged to discern the difference in the spirits. They attributed everything to God. Good stuff, God. Bad stuff, God. People healthy, God. People sick, God. Paul comes along late in the New Testament and says, discern the spirits, try them. See who they be of because there are many spirits gone out into the world. You need to know the difference in what's good and what's evil. Hebrews says, those of you who have eaten strong meat know the difference to discern the difference between good and evil. Why do you need to discern the difference between good and evil? If everything's God, everything's God. I mean, if people need to die, God kills them. If people are sick, God made them sick. If people are having problems, God made them have problems. You go, you could, listen guys, you can come up with 500 good verses from the Old Testament where bad stuff happened because God said it's going to happen to you. And then Jesus comes along and goes, I rebuke you. You don't know my dad. That's not how my dad feels about you. It's time you to learn to discern the spirits. But they couldn't discern the spirits. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. And then Pentecost happens and the Holy Ghost moves inside. And the New Testament begins to challenge Christians to say, there's something happening in the spirit realm. There's powers and principalities. It's not God making all this stuff happen to you. You need to know the difference.